Hello, everyone. Welcome to this video by Real Life Trading uh, of Retirement Resources, Inc. Lauren Olson is an um, investment advisor. My investment advisor has a big chunk of my family's retirement funds that he manages for me. But let me go ahead and do my normal introduction. Thanks for watching this video for Real Life Trading. My name is Brad Reed, and I am a real life trader, and I'd like to encourage you to be good. And by good, I mean get out of debt, achieve your financial dreams, and give generously to your community. And once again, thanks for watching this video. So, Lauren, some folks ask me, Brad, if I'm a trader, why do I have a registered investment advisor that controls a big part of my portfolio? And as you and I have talked in the past, um, I, have, uh, I am trading for my family's wants and dreams, and you have my retirement needs. Um, so first of all, thank you for taking care of my family. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to you and allow you to introduce yourself to talk a little bit about your trading strategies and how you do it, because it's uh, pretty unique. So Lauren, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, Brad. And, and uh, I want to thank everybody too for uh, your patience yeah, while we were trying to figure out how to get into this, um, uh, to the webinar. Um, I'm Lauren Olson. Uh, Brad and I have known each other for years. Um, he was in Kansas City for some time when we met. He talked to several advisors and just uh, decided that uh, he, he wanted me to work with uh, some of his clients. Um, I think to answer your question, uh, one of the reasons that people uh, like Brad use an advisor is that a lot of people will just take a portion of a small amount of their money and trade uh, in terms of day trading. Um, and I can't say that for everybody, but uh, I do have some clients uh, that um, um, whose money I manage that are also uh, trading through uh, real life trading. Um, yeah, I've been in the business, if they had my firm over 25 years. So I'm what's, uh, what's called a registered investment advisor. And everything that we do is, is on a fee basis only. And what that simply means is that we don't charge commissions. I don't earn any commissions. Uh, so I don't have any an agenda uh, in terms of um, uh, making recommendations for clients. Um, yeah, so um, Brad had indicated that I'm a, an advisor that trades. And uh, if I don't have to trade, I would just as soon keep uh, the particular sectors that we own as long as they're performing and behaving. Uh, but occasionally we just uh, we have to make changes. So I'm not going to sit and watch something go down. Uh, we're going to move out of out of um, uh, non-performing sectors and find those uh, those particular uh, asset classes that are performing, and we'll get into the into the nuts and bolts uh, here in any minute. Um, uh, I also write a commentary, and this commentary is, I, I meet, email this to um, uh, clients, prospects, we've got uh, several people that are just uh, a list that I've sent out. A lot of people will, will reply to the commentary and say they like it, it's short. Uh, we try to put a little humor uh, in it. So if you'd like to uh, get on the list to receive my commentary, you can just email me. Uh, and you can see my email address on the screen. Um, um, we do, in terms of our trading, I like to call it tactical. And so there's there's really two different types of management. There's tactical and strategic. And strategic is really just kind of a buy and hold. Uh, a lot of advisors still, uh, still use a strategic methodology you know, where they you know, diversify among stocks, uh, bonds, and cash, uh, and pretty much buy and hold and tell their clients to be patient. Um, yeah, the problem is that um, uh, when you when you're when you're in a buy and hold strategy, you just you have to uh, you have to be extremely patient, especially during times uh, market declines and um, uh, if people are uh, are just not wanting to. To, um, um, uh, to to be to, to be strategic, so to speak, they're wanting somebody that can move their money around. So, if anybody has any interest, uh, I can assure you that um, if we're managing money for a client, uh, 
oh, we're not going to put you on a mutual fund, park it, and just forget about it. As a matter of fact, we're not going to forget about you either. We, we try to stay in touch with our clients on a regular basis. So with that said, I am going to get started. Um, Brad, can you see the screen? Yep, your screen looks great. We can see the uh, Dorsey Wright matrix. Okay. Um, uh, I subscribe to a system, it's called Dorsey Wright, and associate is the name of the company. Uh, Tom Dorsey is the, um, uh, is the owner of the company. He started it uh, probably about 30 years ago. He's written several books. Uh, um, his latest book is called uh, 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 point and figure, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. You'll see what we're talking about. Um, uh, but Dorsey Wright is the engine behind everything that we do, and it's it's based on we do a, 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 a sector rotation based on a formula called relative strength. And what what relative strength is about is is how one fund is performing relative to another. And so um, I'm going to start. If, if you can see the, uh, let me go to the buys. Uh, you can see semiconductor. Um, and, and these are the top performing sectors that we, um, that we currently own. And so when we look at semiconductor, and if you can follow my screen, uh, we're comparing this to uh, precious metals. And so there's a formula that they apply and how, is, how are semiconductors performing relative to precious metals? And so uh, based on uh, that particular formula, if we wanted to know which uh, we should own, whether it's semiconductors or precious metals, it's telling us that uh, semiconductors are substantially outperforming precious metals. Uh, now uh, we've got, I, I have always said that I monitor about 40 different sectors. Uh, right now, if you look at the uh, total sectors in the matrix, uh, you're looking at 32. That's because we're really in a bull market trend. And um, if, we're, if, we, if that reverses, if we go to a bear market trend, uh, then I've got some short funds that I used um, in, another, in another matrix. So I would switch to that matrix um, and monitor those short funds uh, during a, a, a bear market trend. So how does this work? Uh, Dorsey Wright does all the calculations. So if we look at semiconductors and if we do a relative strength compared to precious metals, uh, we also have to do a relative strength uh, calculation compared to government bonds. And you can see where my, where my cursor is pointing. That's um, pro funds, government bond funds. Uh, so uh, this is the calculation. Uh, so let's just say as an example, we have 40 different sectors and uh, we want to do relative strength calculations on all 40 sectors. Uh, what has to be done is that uh, you've got 40, uh, it's, it, it really doesn't, it really, it really is not 1600, but if you get 40 times 40 sectors, you've got about 1600 calculations. And these calculations have to be done on a daily basis. So I build this matrix, I set the parameters, and I have this go in every night and, and, and calculate. Uh, so and the, yeah, I get up in the morning, I grab my coffee, and I stagger to my office at home, and I pull it up, and I look, and, and I just, I can monitor and look at any trends or changes in trends. But the basic, um, uh, the basic premise behind it is called relative strength, how one fund is performing to, uh, to others. And we just simply want to own those top performing funds. Brad, is there a chat screen that I should pull up to see if there are any questions? Uh, Lauren, there are no questions right now, but if you move your mouse, I think to the top, there will be something that says uh, more dot, 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 or there may be a button that says chat. Uh, okay. 
it'll either be at the very top or the very bottom, and then you can open up the chat window. Okay, there it is. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, now we have to start. We have to have some place to um, determine where we're going to start looking in terms of um, uh, in terms of buying our particular sectors. So it's just kind of it's it's like digging for gold. If you want to dig for gold, you've got to know where to start. Uh, if you if you're drilling for oil, you you know you you got to know where the oil's at. So uh, Dorsey Wright um, monitors six broad asset classes. Yeah, it's called uh, it's we we just call it a DALI, yeah, Dynamic Asset Level Investing. So as you can see, these six broad asset classes are domestic equities international equities, commodities, fixed income, cash, and currencies. So if I'm not going to go through all of these, but if you look at the buy signals, and this is just uh, simply saying that domestic equities relative to these other broad asset classes has 312 buy signals. Inter international equities is 296. So uh, what this is simply telling us is that uh, this is where we need to focus. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to be looking at, and that's why I don't have any short funds right now because the domestic equities are doing well and followed by international equities. Now, we all know that this can change. And if we look at 2008 as an example, I've got my chat screen covering some things. Um, I don't know if you can see this as well, but here's, this is 331 of 2008 and up through 330 of 2009. And so if you look at the broad classes, you don't see, you don't see uh, international or domestic equities. Yeah, so we've got currencies, 224, uh, 247, followed by commodities, fixed income cash, international equities. And domestic equities are all the way at the bottom. So um, I don't know how many people had money invested in 2008, uh, but if you did, if you were, if you had a strategic manager, if you were thinking strategically, you were probably writing that portfolio down 40 or 50 percent. And I just simply tell my clients we're not going to do it. Um, if we have this kind of data, and we know that. Um, uh, it's, it's it's time to move. Domestic equities are are, are not performing. They're, they're they're no longer within the top echelon of the uh, uh, broad classes. Then we're going to move probably on things like fixed annuities, cash, commodities, and currencies. Um, we also pay attention to what's called a technical attribute score. In other words, Dorsey Wright will take a number of broad sectors, um, uh, countries, the S&P 500, et cetera, uh, and give them what's called a technical attribute score. Now, this is important because this is a, it's a ranking that's applied to all stocks using both of what's called a trend and relative strength analysis. And uh, there's five criteria that they use to come up with this, um, uh, to arrive at the score. And uh, the criteria are going to be anywhere from uh, a relative strength signal versus the market, um, uh, the uh, chart column versus the market, um, the uh, relative strength signal versus the peer group of other of other funds, um, and uh, the market trend, etc. So what we want to do is we want to own uh, these uh, the sectors within this that within this top echelon of the um, um, of, of a relative strength score anywhere from four to six. And so if a, if a fund has a has a uh, technical attribute score of anywhere between four and six. We call that, we just call them good citizen. And uh, so that's where we want to focus. And uh, from here, and we, and this is, this is really kind of a confirmation of you know, when I go into my matrix uh, and I look at my top 
uh, top funds. Uh, are they, uh, internet as an example, banks, technology, Latin America, uh, industrials, biotech, financials, we own all of those. And this is a confirmation that um, uh, the, uh, relative to some of the other funds, uh, their technical attribute score is the best. Um, if we scroll down, and a lot of advisors will say you, you need to own a certain amount of money in, in uh, stocks, bonds, and cash. Uh, but if we look at all fixed income, in other words, bonds, and we can look at that technical attribute score, it just, it, it's, they're just not performing. And especially with interest rates rising, uh, bonds are just not where we want to be today. Uh, but, but that will change. That will change. And so what I've done <clears throat> is that I've got a check mark next to, we're going to look at S&P 500. Uh, we're going to compare this to uh, all U.S. fixed income. And then we want to look at precious metals. Uh, so we can do a chart. And we come up with what I call a mess. <laughs> so... Um, S and P 500 and, um, the I'm colorblind. <laughs> so the S and P 500 is in blue. Uh, if, uh, in 2008, uh, you can see that the S and P 500, uh, is in, in terms of the technical attribute score, uh, certainly way below, um, and you know, we're looking at commodities and fixed income. So that's, that's, that's obvious. Back in 2008, we just did not. You know, we don't. We don't need to be. We need to be out of the uh, the market, so to speak, um, in terms of domestic equities. And so you can see how uh, the trend um, in 2012. We also saw where domestic equities, commodities, etc., uh, came up and surpassed the S and P 500. So it's just telling us, you know, those are some areas that we need to think about. We need to own. Uh, pay attention to. Also in 2016, yeah, I don't know if, I, if you all remember that uh, in January through about mid-February, we had a, about a 10% decline in the market. Um, and if we go back to our uh, DALI, our broad asset classes, in 2016, domestic equities moved down into third place. And it was just simply telling us, okay, man, things are not looking good. And uh, I was uh, listening to some webinars with Dorsey Wright, and they were just saying that we need to take some, some defensive positions. So uh, I raised some cash. I raised a lot of cash, and we actually own some utilities, some government bonds, commodities, et cetera. Um, fortunately, everything bottomed out and turned around and, and came back up. So 2016 ended up with a, you know, with a fairly decent year. Not a great year, but a fairly decent year. Uh, so uh, this is just telling us again uh, that, you know, we need to pay attention to these types of things, these, uh, these, these graphs so we, we know. Um, uh, where the strength is at, uh, where the weakness is at, and where we need to be. So obviously we can see again this dispersion uh, where the S&P 500 um, is in terms of, once again, in terms of the technical attribute score uh, is, is, a, is, is far outperforming the domestic or um, fixed income and uh, commodities. Okay, let's go back to the um, yeah, to the matrix. Uh, now, uh, when we look at the matrix, and again, uh, I get up every day and I, I take a look at this um, um, because this is updated every night, so we're, we're not going to see a lot of movement, uh, but we'll start seeing some trends that I need to pay attention to. And so if I'm looking at semiconductors, um, and it's, you know, it's got, in, in terms of buy signals relative to the other funds, it's got 30 buy signals. Now, where you also see what are called, we also see exits 
And so uh, what are exits? Exits just simply means that uh, it's on a buy signal and the prices are going up. If we're looking at um, the fund itself, we're not, we're not uh, comparing this. This is not a relative strength calculation. It's just a trend chart uh, that we're looking at. And here's when we get into the point and figure side of it that um, um, Tom Dorsey talks about in his book. Yeah, so it's really just a matter of X's and O's. X's means the prices are going up, O's means the uh, prices are going down. So uh, you can see that uh, we've got a, a, a series of O's and this happened back in uh, January, February. Uh, or I'm sorry, this uh, we're talking about this year. So uh, this happened back in February when there was a, little, a lot of concern and a lot of talk with, um, uh, and, and I, I don't even know if I remember what the um, yeah, what the news was at the time, uh, but we saw some market declines that um, were substantial, and uh, that's this point right here. Uh, now. Uh, when I am monitoring these funds, yeah, we look at this score. So if, um, if semiconductors have reached a high point of 51.2, uh, then uh, I want to put a stop loss in this. So I'm looking at uh, if this thing reverses 10%, um, you know, I may want to get out. And so we just do, we don't want to, um, uh, watch one of these things continue to go down. Uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're getting out at a particular point. And I think most people that trade, you know, put stop losses in on their, on their trades themselves. Uh, so um, um, let's look at a couple of other things. <clears throat> we can look at this if I'm if I'm looking at this fund, we're using what's called an intermediate term scale. And so if I'm wanting to look at any trend of a reversal back up, if it's holding uh, at this point at 46.4, I can look at a short term scale, which is just simply telling me that um, these calculations are done uh, more on a short-term basis than the intermediate-term basis. Now, when I say short-term basis, that's kind of a lot of the noise that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I'm really uh, making my decisions based on an, on an intermediate-term uh, scale versus a short-term. But occasionally, I'll go out and look at a short-term basis to see if there's a if, if there's a trend of something reversing. Um, did you guys ever hear of overbought, oversold? I'm sure everybody has. Uh, so, uh, so we can look at uh, the overbought, oversold conditions. And so if I'm not in a particular fund, and but I'm seeing where it's trending up, uh, you know, I don't want to buy it uh, when it's sitting here at the, in an overbought condition of 214 um, um, percent. Uh, so we're looking at things. So at this point, uh, if we look at the buys, if we look at the X's, et cetera, and if we look at the um, uh, overbought, oversold condition, we can say that, um, yeah, this happens to be Latin America, by the way. <coughs> we can say this is not a, it's, it's, it's not a bad entry point. Uh, so um, I would certainly, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching Latin America to, um, for this to reverse, for this trend to reverse from, uh, O's to X's. Um, one of the ways that we do that is we can set an alert. Uh, so you see a pullback, et cetera, uh, stock trend reverse to O's uh, and so forth. So we can set an alert where that stock trend reverses to X's. And uh, when that happens, then I get an email from Dorsey Wright saying uh, that Latin America has reversed its trend chart is reversed back up to X's. And so that's my entry point where I say I want to buy. Um, we can look at performance. How has this fund been doing? 
So uh, we compare this uh, Latin America over the past seven days, uh, minus 1.4, 30 days, 0.7, 60, 90, uh, year to date up 21.78% uh, versus the S&P of 2.08%. So obviously if we can own these particular countries or these, um, or these sectors, yeah, we're narrowing down to those specific sectors that are outperforming. And in most cases, when you, we have you know, what's called a fairly sizable dispersion between the uh, sectors and the broad market, such as the S&P 500, uh, you're going to see uh, a, a big difference in terms of performance. Um, so clients like that. I mean, we like that. When we, you know, we've got funds that we've owned uh, for a year and they're up 60, 70%. <laughs> um, we've done the activity alert, et cetera. Um, and now, I will also go in, because if we back up uh, to the matrix, let me back up one more time and let's look at the X's. Okay, so again, what an X simply means is that uh, the price is moving up uh, at, a, at a higher rate relative in this particular case to 31 other funds. Yeah, so that means that uh, in terms of relative strength, Latin America has, has uh, the greatest relative strength of all the other funds uh, that we're looking at. Um, but this, but I also want to go down and I want to look at some other funds of what's trending. Where are we seeing a, a, a reversal? Yeah, and so I've been watching consumer services. Yeah, consumer services has 24 X's, but it only has 16 buys. Yeah, so if we go back and if we look at consumer services, yeah, it's ranked up. Yeah, consumer services is ranked at number 15. Okay, so I don't know. It. Yeah, but uh, because we're seeing uh, the trend, we're seeing some momentum with consumer services that I'm watching it. And so again, I can go in and I can you know, look at the chart. I can see it had a big run up. Uh, and all of our charts look like this uh, because back in February when we had that reversal in the market, uh, we, they're, they're gonna reverse. But, uh, so I'm watching consumer services. When I see this reversal, uh, this back into X's, that's my indication that I want to buy. So <clears throat> I've set up an alert. Uh, stock uh, stock funds trend chart column reversed to X's. Uh, so when that happens, I get an email from Dorsey Wright. Uh, I can go into consumer services and I can and um, I can get online and buy it. And, and by the way, I may sell something uh, to buy it or I may take it from cash. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and then we've got a total score yeah, which, uh, you know, I'll often look at in terms of, yeah, okay, what are the two? We, you know, we, we like a high number of X's. We like a high number of buys. Uh, so if we look at a total score, that's a pretty, pretty good idea of the top performance sectors that we need to own. And then we, we look at the technical attribute score. This, uh, we're, getting, we're getting about as high as you can get in terms of a technical attribute score. Uh, so we have to say those are, you know, those are the good citizens. They're the ones that are that are behaving, and uh, they're, they're the ones that we want to own. So uh, the same way with X's, we can look at this from the reverse side of what's not been performing, and you can see once again precious metals, oil and equipment, Japan, uh, real estate, uh, utilities, consumer goods. Um, uh, so these, this just happens to be the, these are the, the sectors that we we want to stay away from. Then get rid of that. Okay. 
Uh, now, you guys look at a lot of charts. Brad, I notice when I log in, you guys are constantly uh, looking at charts. Well, we want to look at charts too. So if we look at thumbs, <clears throat> and now I can just scroll down through each uh, one of these sectors and I can look at the chart. And this is the chart where it's just, uh, this is the trend chart. In other words, this the, uh, this particular one hey, is not a relative strength. It's not comparing it uh, to any other fund. It's just simply saying, okay, what's what's the trend? And the trend right now is that it's in a column of X's. Uh, it reversed down uh, recently, took a little uh, took a little breather, so to speak, and then came back up. And, and so we've got a buy signal on another and another buy signal. And a buy signal is just simply generated when one X it exceeds a previous column of, of, of two other Xs. And so it's on a buy signal. And then I can also look at how are semiconductors doing to the S&P 500. Now, when we, this particular S&P 500 is the equal weighted. In other words, it's not a cap weighted that uh, most of us look at when we're looking at the S what the S&P 500 has done at the, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so uh, it, it, the trend looks good. Uh, semiconductors look good compared to uh, the S&P 500 equal weight. Hey, and so that's just simply telling us that compared to the broad market, we would rather own semiconductors than the S&P. And, and, but that's not to say that the S&P hasn't been performing well because I actually own a couple of um, S&P 500 um, uh, indexes, or the we own the Dow and we own the S&P 500 index because they are uh, doing so well and they're a little more conservative. Uh, bear with me, trying to pull up. Okay. Uh, when we go, uh, when we look at <clears throat> uh, technical attribute scores. Once again, uh, we want to look at uh, okay, where you know where's the strength? Uh, okay, what what are all the sectors that have the um, you know the strong scores? Uh, one of the things that we've noticed are like all emerging markets equities, emerging markets diversified, uh, international, and, and once again, if we go back to our daily charts, international is in the second position. Domestic equities are, are, are number one. But how do we wait? I mean, how much, you know, how much do we want to own in, in international? So uh, this is a graph and it's, this is just simply showing uh, the technical attribute score uh, non-US uh, versus the S&P 500. And uh, so the non-US funds uh, have, in terms of dispersion, um, uh, foreign funds, international, so, et cetera, uh, have underweighted in, in, in terms of their technical attribute score followed behind. Uh, but you can see right here, uh, where this dispersion, the gap has been closed. And now uh, international, especially the emerging markets uh, right now in terms of a technical, it's just a stronger uh, than the S&P 500. Uh, so when we reach this point, it's telling me, you know, maybe I want to overweight a little more on the international side because of the strength. And uh, once again, uh, these charts are valuable charts and telling us uh, uh, not only where we need to have our money, but how much uh, that weighting should be. Uh, so I've increased uh, my weighting on the international side um, uh, based on what I'm looking at uh, with these charts. And it just depends on where the dispersion goes. If it starts moving the other direction, uh, then I can always come back and you know change that weighting. Uh, 
Uh, at last, uh, Dorsey Wright, and these are the folks. This is the uh, this is kind of the home page. Uh, it's uh, the educational page. Uh, there, there, are uh, plenty of tutorials. Yeah, where they talk about their PNF charts, uh, reading relative strength charts, chart links and tools, smart charts, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it's just plenty of information that I can go in and I can uh, watch a webinar or listen to uh, what's going on uh, and, and try to stay abreast of, of what's happening. Um, and not only with the market, but with their particular system. And you know, I have to tell you, every time I go in and listen to these guys speak, uh, I, I learn something you know, just about every time. So uh, that's what I do. I don't know how long I've talked. Brad, I think you gave me you know, what, probably about 30 minutes. Yeah, Lauren, it, it sounds good. And as I'm, you know, for, I guess those of y'all that don't know, I've been with Lauren since long before real life trading ever existed. And I hear you talk about using your protective stops. You've got the, the dally charts for your screener to help kind of know which area to go look at. We have our screeners as well when we're doing our trades. Um, you know, your point and figure charts here have your, um, you know, opportunities and the charts and, you know, the, the green and the red there look like buy and sell opportunities. And we have our charts and there's just so much that's, that's similar between the way you do your trading um, and, and sort of the way we do ours, we, we have different charts, different screeners, different that type of stuff. But, um, it, you know, Lauren, I made the decision to, to let you do a lot of, uh, to manage, you know, a lot of our money, because if the market does go down, you have a strategy for that. Um, even if it's just moving into cash, but I know you talked about inverse funds and you showed how, um, was it precious metals and commodities and, and cash, uh, did really well when the market was going down. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of similarities with the way you trade. And, and when we do these interviews on Wednesday, um, I guess early afternoon, late mornings, we just try and share how other people trade. Uh, Lauren, do you have a chart that shows your results over the last couple of years compared to the market or, or just how your uh, strategies have been winning? Well, uh, the last couple of years, uh, last year, uh, and I'll just tell you that we were up 17% uh, on a moderate portfolio. And, um, and I have to tell you that at the, in the beginning of the year, um, I moved into some sectors. Uh, and, you know, it's not a perfect system by any means, but I had moved into some sectors at the beginning of the year that looked good. It uh, doesn't mean they always uh, they always behave as they should. Yeah, sometimes they'll you know the, we'll see the momentum we buy it and then it reverses and we just have to move back out again. But we're just you know just, so um, we we were up about seventeen percent last year. I I just I just took this over in two thousand twelve. Mm -hmm. I had other third party managers um, uh, managing the portfolios. So uh, we're up about 80% since I took it over. 80%, holy smokes. And um, um, the, the That's thing, good, Lauren. Be, pr be proud of that. <laughs> when you look at a year like we've had uh, this past year, it's not that hard uh, to make money. In other words, people that have got mutual funds that they just buy and buy and hold in a growth fund, et cetera, is going to do well. But the key is, and I try to tell my clients, <clears throat> you know, we're going to at some point in time, you know, we're going to see another 2008. Uh, I don't know when it uh, when it's going to happen. Yeah, but uh, what is, uh, you know, what's the strategy uh, that you have? What's the strategy that your advisor has? Uh, to keep you from, you know, from losing half of your money. And uh, what's and, and here's what's going to happen uh, with us is that um, these these broad asset classes move very slow. And so, uh, when domestic equities gets down into the third or fourth position, we're probably going to be down. You know, in a, in a uh, and when we re refer to a bear market, we may be down about 10%. And that's okay. Uh, I mean, we were down 10% back in January of 2016. 
Um, but we, we made up for it. Um, but that's where it stops. And that's when I make the change, I make the move. And if, and if it's anything like a 2008, where the market continues to go down and we're investing, we, we move now out of domestic equities uh, into commodities and some short funds. And you know, we can easily short the S&P 500. And then we can make up that 10% by the time that bear market has decided to, to uh, take a nap. So, and I've talked to other guys, many guys, I, you know, I wasn't using the system. I had another guy that was doing the management uh, for clients. I was not using this system back in 2008, but I've talked to many guys that, um, um, we're using Dorsey right, and, and for the most part, they're saying, "Yeah, you know, we broke even. We made a little bit, a little money. We were up four or five percent for the year. That's a lot better than losing forty or fifty percent." Absolutely, yeah. Uh, got a question in the chat pane, Lauren, uh, and I'm going to expand on the question. But James is asking if you have free initial phone consultations, and I know the answer is going to be yes. So I'm going to expand that. Uh, and ask uh, what type of clients are you looking for? Because I hear on the radio all the all the time about these financial advisors that care so much and want to help me so much, but only if I have half a million dollars for them to manage. Um, and if I had half a million dollars, I probably wouldn't need a financial <laughs> advisor, or maybe I would. But what type of um, what type of clients uh, do you manage? Uh, uh, you know, we'd like to get fifty thousand. I would take less. Uh, I look at this in terms of how can we help somebody? And one of the reasons that we can do that, I can take a smaller account is because uh, I, I do what's called a block trading. In other words, when a, uh, when a client becomes a client, uh, we do a profile in terms of their risk return characteristic. And uh, so, uh, you know, in these sector funds are called the pro funds. There's nothing, there's, there's, there's nothing all that great about the pro funds. They just mirror the um, uh, Dow Jones sectors. It's up to me to uh, determine which sectors to be in. Uh, but uh, when they're a client, um, uh, then I don't have to go in and look at each individual account. Yeah, in other words, I can trade all my accounts uh, in about 10 minutes. And so if, if, if somebody has a smaller account, it doesn't take me any, any more time to go in and, and work with that account, trade it, et cetera, because of the block trading that we do. So there's some efficiencies there that allow me to, um, you know, to bring in smaller clients. Um, obviously, we, we, you know, if somebody comes in, if they've got a half a million dollars and they say, can I give you 50? Uh, well, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, we, uh, and you know as well as I do, Brad, that a lot of people just kind of put toe in the water, so to speak. You know, we want to try it out and see how it goes. And, yeah, you know. I like to, to try it out. Um, Lauren, I also hear a lot on the radio about um, Social Security maximization and other type retirement prediction type planning, tax avoidance, stuff like that. You offer all that stuff, right? Well, I do. I write financial plans. And now, now when I say financial plans, uh, you know, financial planning are really financial plans, financial projections, uh, et cetera. And so part of our uh, plans that we write, uh, you've got to have a detailed tax report. Yeah, so if somebody's retiring, if they're going to, if they're going to start receiving social security and yeah, our tax report, we can go in and do a listing of all the taxable items. Uh, so in other words, um, somebody's, um, the client has social security. Well, how much of that social security is being taxed? Uh, we, we make all those calculations. So uh, many people will come into my office and they'll say, I don't have, I don't have any idea if I've got enough money to, you know, to last the rest of my life. Uh, so I do that. Um, and it's an added value. I do it at no charge for clients. That's awesome. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. I, uh, you know, I, I know about trading and I have my financial licenses. And so when I hear 
these things on the radio, I can sort of dissect and I can hear the gotchas and I, and I hear the traps on the radio where I think most people may not just because I have been in the industry. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, Lauren, yeah, we are getting towards the end of our time. Do you want to put your contact information up one more time? And um, if you folks in the chat room have any questions, go ahead and type those in. Um, and yeah, Lauren, there you go. Uh, now, Lauren, you talked about a uh, an email that you send out. Um, yeah, it's it's once a week on Friday. It's uh, about two or three paragraphs. Um, it, it's sort of Lauren's view of the market and what's going on. And James uh, says yeah, more read. advisors the better. Um, yeah, and so I was going to ask you uh, how how could people sign up for that at least? Send me an email. And just say, please add add me to your email list. Okay. And uh, so we'll put, uh, you know, we'll put those people on the email list and they'll start getting the commentary uh, on Fridays. They're short. Uh, they're, you know, they're not two, maybe three, four paragraphs. I try to uh, try to be light with a little humor, but um, uh, the responses that I get is that everybody uh, likes the commentary. And I also post it on LinkedIn. So if you want to uh, uh, if you want to make a connection with me on LinkedIn, just type my name in and just go in and say please connect, and I'll connect with you, and and uh, you'll start getting the, the commentary. Uh, awesome, Lauren. Uh, consultations. I'm happy to to talk to anybody on the phone. Give me a call. We can sit down and talk about um, what your what your objectives concerns are. Uh, and, and how I can help. All right, Lauren, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today on our day trading floor. Folks, for any other videos uh, like this, feel free to swing over to www.reallifetrading.com. And as always, trade on logic, not on hope. Have a good one, everybody.